stunning. Hello, everybody. This is I Should Be Writing number 526, I believe. It is the final in our, uh, it's the final stupid software. <laughs> it is the final in the, uh, outlining series, kind of. But here's my problem. Um, well, I'll, I'll say my problem with Story Grid later. I should probably do the show the way it's supposed to be done, which is, my name is Mer Lafferty. This is I Should Be Writing, a podcast for wannabe fiction writers. I have been trying to um, get started on a fun project that's completely unlike anything I mentioned last time. I'm kind of doing the waiting for my book to come back from my editor thing, so I'll just play. Um, and it's fun. I wrote another scene for a uh, audio drama I want to do. Hey, K. Kimmy. Thank you for the follow. Yeah, I don't even know. I'll say case one. Sorry. But I'm... And there's the dog. Sorry, trying to fix something on my software, and I tried to fix it, but I still have to have the the, uh, the camera right there and that camera right there, so it's not great. Hey, Cheryl. So, yeah, I've been working on audio drama and um, trying to understand the various outlining methods we have. I started the Take Your Pants Off book, or Take Off Your Pants, or whatever it was, the one that's not explicit in the Amazon store. And I started working on Story Grid. And I realized I hadn't read it all the way through, and then I remembered why. It's pretty dense. And with a how-to book, I need, like, clear instructions and not dense description about how awesome Lolita was and how we, as if he's including me, sympathize with the sexual predator that is the protagonist of Lolita. Yeah, I tried to read that once and it might have been the fact that my daughter was nine at the time, but uh, put that one down. Sure, Nabokov, good job being a paragon of literature. But I'm good. You'd say that has nothing to do with the story grid, but the description's in the book, so. Hey, thanks for the follow, Kofnik. Um. So then I went online and downloaded all of the, uh, all of their resources. We got the Fool's Cap story grid, um, the five leaf genre infographic and this nightmare that is the story grid for silence of the lambs and then this utter nightmare that is the other story grid for silence of the lambs and no i'm not going to be going over this but it took i'm embarrassed it took me a while to realize this and i have to apologize to you guys yeah thank you kit our writing um it took me a while to realize this, but I think Story Grid is a second draft outlining tool. Because the things he's asking you to outline are detailed scenes. And I'm not outlining detailed scenes because I don't know the details of the scenes I'm outlining. So that is unfortunate. Um, I think it might be good to do an editing show and use Story Grid because it does have interesting concepts. But he did mention that um, he, he name dropped his friend Stephen Pressfield. Numbers Ninja is back and telling me to drink more water. I wonder whether you're going to run out of channel points or I'm going to run out of water first. We shall see. 
I'm looking up Stephen Pressfield's book because I forget people's I, I forget book titles and people's names all the time. So I need to remember if it's the book I I think it is. But I did hydrate because you told me to. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. How's everybody doing? Well, it's even wrong, apparently. Oh, poop. I hate the Kindle app. I really, really hate it. It's, it's so terrible. Um... Please tell me you're the book I think you are. Oh no, it's the War of Art guy. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I had I I done a post about uh did a podcast about the War of Art, revisiting the War of Art several years later, and um didn't like it as much as the first time I read it. Oh, Todd's enjoying the outside. Nice. Because we have a lovely day, a little chilly, but um, that's my problem. Like this morning inside the house, my hands were just icy cold. I need to find my fingerless gloves. But anyway, I thought Stephen Pressfield was the guy who wrote the Hidden Rules of Comedy, which is an excellent book. But no, Stephen Pressfield's the guy that wrote War of Art. Anyway, the, uh, the thing is, he said Stephen Pressfield had never, uh, sold a, a novel. And so the guy sat down with him and said, let's do, let's break your, your story down into three. We've got kittens listening, whi listening to kittens whine in the other room, knitting a new pair of fingerless gloves. Oh, wow. I tried knitting fingerless gloves once. It went very, very po po poorly. And Breezy says, as I fall, never leave. I hear that. So, he said he made the guy, uh, he split a, a page into thirds and said, you have to put, list everything in your act one here, everything in your act two here, and everything in your act three here. And the guy resisted because he's like, oh, there's too much in my book. And the author said, well, I can put Moby Dick in this. That sounded a lot dirtier than I meant it to. Sorry. Um, I could put any piece of great literature into this grid. Why can't you put yours? Uh, no, Fida, you didn't miss too much. Good to see you. Um, really, I'm embarrassed to admit I'm discovering that StoryGrid is a better second draft outlining tool because it requires you to be heavily detailed in what you know is going to be happening in your scenes. And if you are that detailed, then you've probably outlined it somewhere else. I'm missing something there. So that's why I think it's a ne it's a second draft outlining tool for you to plug your book into and then see if you're missing anything or your one part is too bloated, etc. So, um, so yeah, if you go to the site of the uh, story grid, and go to the resources page, you can download this it's called the Foolscap Global Story Grid for Fiction. I don't know why it's called Foolscap. Maybe I skipped over that part. I'm not sure. But this is the Foolscap Story Grid. So I'm going to try to fill out the Story Grid and then, you know, we'll do question and answer as best I can. I'm sorry, the book and the process is a little dense for me and to use as a how to book. If you want to learn how, I mean, it, it's a it's supposed to be how editors work and how editors look at stories. So if you're interested in that, it's very illuminating. But in flipping through and trying to hit like high points of just, I don't care what your opinion of Lolita and Moby Dick are. I want to know what you, what an external genre is. It's it's hard to um, navigate. I believe the word is. So. In the Fool's Cap story grid, he does not have what he challenged Stephen Pressfield with, which is the global genre. There's external genre, external value at stake, internal genre, internal value at stake, obligatory scenes and conventions, point of view, objects of desire, and controlling idea slash theme. And I kind of feel like 
he's taking things that we've already that's already been well trod and, and given it another name. Um, yeah, so the whole external genre, um, external value at stake, I guess that feels like, uh, like for me, that would be uh, science fiction and the lives of every clone on Earth is the external value at stake. Um, I'll put that over here. Is where being left-handed would be ha ha uh, helpful. Or ambidextrous. Um, thanks for dropping by, Shale. Um, I figured out somebody Dang it, I can't remember who uh, told me how to get verified on YouTube, and I figured <laughs> I already was verified on YouTube. Oh boy, so um, I've been able to upload the files to YouTube, so these will li last forever, or at least, at least as long as YouTube does. So, if you want to catch up and you don't get it when it's on Twitch for 14 days, it will be on YouTube. So, um, yeah, so value... Lives of all clones. Internal genre. Now, I didn't get to this. That That's embarrassing. I'm not sure. We've got this big five, five leaf thing, and the printout doesn't even have leaves. It's got... I really don't... I don't know what internal genre is. But this seems to, this feels like the external need or the, the want of the book and the need of the book. Or the want of the protagonist and the need of the protagonist. Because, you know, what you want and what you need, what your character wants and what they need is completely different. That's the whole point of your story is for them to search for what they want, find what they need, and get a good denouement and make it exciting. Um, point of view is interesting. Um, if you've watched the other two episodes, you know I've wrestled with this because while it's essentially a story about a handful of people who are on a space station and thrown into a the most dangerous game kind of situation and try to get free and get help every single per every single group or faction has a very different goal there's there's you know there's the goal of revenge there's the goal of save all the clones on earth there's the goal of wow, I really screwed up my job and I just need to get out of this alive and get away from these crazy clones forever. So, um, it took me a while to decide who gets the POV. I could, I could flip between them. I've done that on my last two books. But, um, you kind of have to have one protagonist. If you have more than one protagonist, you're probably writing epic fantasy and can juggle more flaming tennis balls than I can. But for most books, we've got protagonist and antagonist, and uh, you know, even if those, if, even if everybody gets a POV, the story is about the protagonist going for what they want and the antagonist getting in the way. So, um, previously I'd done it in, I believe, the, uh, right, the last time with the, uh, save the cat method, I actually took the human's point of view and told the book from her, sorry, from her point of view, and that changed it a little bit and solidified it for me, which was good. But I think I'm going to go with um, the previous antagonist of the first book. And 
I don't know if you've read Six Wakes, and I don't know if you care. I'll try to keep it uh, spoiler-free, but it's a little tough because it's a continuation of that story. But um, we're going to say... We haven't done her point of view, so we're going to do that. Um, Sally Mignon is the POV. <clears throat> Objects of Desire. That would be Clean Code. Um, all the all the databases on Earth, or the cloning machines, I'm not sure which one. I think it might have to be the cloning machines themselves are corrupted, so even if you put clean information in to make a new clone, it gets corrupted on the way out. So they're looking for clean code to fix that. Um, I'll boil down the human's needs and just say shuttle keys and revenge from the other characters. Um, controlling idea and theme Wow, I can't read that, and my handwriting is so bad. I'm glad I'm blocking it on the video. Um, controlling idea and theme. I kind of went, I did a theme with Save the Cat, I believe. And that's uh, one person can change the world. But if she is the point of view character, that might mean the book changes theme. Um, I'm thinking if she's the POV character, the controlling idea is uh, some some sins you can't atone for. We have a very reprehensible murder murderer. She she's a murderer. Um, very powerful, very wealthy, and uh, suddenly forced into the position to do some do something for the good of all clones. And there will be other sins revealed in the book as well. There's everything she made the crew of the Dormire to go through, which was no good. Um, so now we have just a basic three-act structure. So we have the uh, inciting incident for e and each one is identical, which feels a little weird. This I think this is why I like Save the Cat the best because for some reason the story fits into Save the Cat in my mind. But Story Grid seems to imply that there's always an inciting incident and always a complication and always a crisis and always a climax and always a resolution. I guess it's boiling it down most areas of the book should be that. Um, you know, here, here is where uh, Save the Cat would call false victory or defeat. And um, then the inciting incident for the third act would be whatever the protagonist does to get out of the terrible spot they found themselves in. Um, under Pope, have to head out, catch the video later. Well, thank you for dropping by. Appreciate you being here anyway. So, um, we have inciting incident. I think. <laughs> I don't, um, write for people to view me very often, or hardly ever. Complication, crisis, climax, resolution. So, inciting incident is clones unauthorized arrive on station 
at the same time as Protag sneaks aboard. Complication. Well, I suppose that would be the uh, the clone stand in her way. She wanted to, it to be a wow. Can you guys read that? I can't read that. Damn, this is hard. Sorry, guys. Like I said, I'm new at this. Um, right, the clone stand in her way because she was going to just get aboard and appeal to people that she she's known for a long time and hasn't seen them in a long time but she she knew them back when clones were young and she she thinks that's going to be her biggest problem is getting through all the old hurts and betrayals between her and the people on the station and it turns out the immediate problem is the fact that three clones have just arrived who want a great deal of revenge from her and so the crisis happens when they're discovered. Uh, they're thrown into the most dangerous game. I'm just calling it that. Basically, they're just put in a place with lots of... Uh, animals and dangerous traps and stuff. It's it's just a, a way the clones keep um, entertained because they're older than dirt and very bored. So they like to watch humans being hunted. It was not in any way inspired by the Hunger Games. Right. Or the most dangerous game. Um, and the resolution, I suppose, would be the alliances, alliances formed to survive, putting aside their old issues because the new clones have, uh, Yeah, they're 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 on they're on a time clock. I haven't mapped that out fully, but um, okay, Kimmy, I have to go pet sit before the migraine hits. But I'll catch up on the recording later. Dang, I'm sorry. I I hope the migraine passes you by, or you manage to not to avoid it or something. But give the pet a pat for me, and uh, we'll see you next time. I hope feel better. See, it's the, the climax and resolution that kind of throws me because I see the first act as sort of a, it's a building block, and then um, your, your characters are trying to build something that they can survive on to get them where they need to go, and I'm saying that loosely, get them what they want, whatever, and then when the end of the first act comes, the antagonist very likely tears it down. And so they're left with nothing, and everything's different. This was the break-in-two point of um, Save the Cat. Because everything changes. Uh, Katniss goes to the capital. Luke goes, uh, gets on the Millennium Falcon. Um, Harry goes to Hogwarts. It's, uh, let's see... John What's-His-Face from Old Man's War leaves Earth and gets his new body. Um, so yeah, it's all a very... It doesn't always have to be like a... a someone comes to town, someone leaves town thing, but things are inevitably changed. And I don't know if that has a resolution. That's, that's where I struggle. Um, but... I'll just say the resolution is alliances are formed. Uh, hey Will, good to see you.
if a story has a false resolution, does that mean the protagonist has more than one need to find? That is an interesting question. What do you mean a false resolution? Are you talking about the false victory or defeat, or are you talking about a false resolution up here? Yeah, and if K. Kimmy and Will, uh, oh no, sorry. You're, you're, you've got the ice squiggle, so you know it's coming. Yeah, mine are only brought about by a little bit of pain, knowing it's going to get worse. Um, Will, we are talking about the story grid, and I have apologized and basically said that uh, I feel this is more of a second draft outlining tool, because you need to have the story be very detailed in order to fill in everything in the story grid. So I apologize for not realizing that before I promised this, but I'm trying to take the Fool's Cap Global Story Grid for Fiction that you can download off of the Story Grid website under Resources and just fill that out. But it's also... What it's also doing is showing me that I am still... Um, I still prefer Save the Cat. Uh, save the Cat. Oh, the False Victory. Okay, um... If the story is a false victory, does that mean the protagonist has more than one need to find? No, the false victory is usually them getting what they want and realizing it is not what they need. Um, Cinderella dances with the prince. For her, she is beautiful, she is free, and everything is magical and everything is wonderful, and she's dancing with the prince. That is a false victory. That is the end of Act 2 of Cinderella. Because after that, everything comes falling down. So, you know, what she needs is not necessarily... Oh, God. It's hard to take what, figure out what Cinderella needs. I guess she, she, she ultimately needs freedom, and what she wants is to go to the ball. So she goes to the ball, and she gets it. But that doesn't help her overall. What she needs is her freedom. So it doesn't change. It just, uh, yeah, false victory usually gives you, gives the character what they want. Uh, Pod girl, good to see you. Alas, thought I could listen in while doing some design work, but the work needs more brain than anticipated. Hopefully we'll catch up later. Well, this will be on the I Should Be Writing feed. It will be on Twitch for two weeks, and it should be on YouTube for as long as they let me keep it up. Um, a seat, I believe. I followed their podcast for a while, but it seems a strange thing to try when my book is only outlined. That, you don't know how good that makes me feel. That, not good. I say relieved. Because I was really trying to get through this and realizing I was looking at it from the completely wrong point of view, which was the point of view of somebody who hasn't written a book yet. And trying to figure out how to answer all of these questions was not working. So, um, I don't know if they sell it like that, but I think they do need to sell it as this is an excellent way to take your existing novel and sort of map it out and make sure it hits all, all the right points. So, um, we have again, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we have inciting incident, um, first attack of tiger or something. Complication, they can't trust each other. Um, the crisis. Crisis Tiger. I mean, it's it's just right there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Complication and Crisis feel too similar to me. It's uh, I'm really not sure because I'd say perhaps something specific happens here that leads to they can't trust each other. I'll just say. Specific, bad, T, B, D. They can't trust each other. And then, um, 
They fight amongst themselves in the climax. And in fighting amongst themselves, they actually find uh, a way out. Now, they want the help of the people on the space station. So they think this is the false victory. Well, they don't think it's false. They think this is their victory because they are free of the game and they can go and try to find someone to help them. Um, but it's false because when they find somebody, they get a big fat no. And so the last act would be find old clones, I'll say. There are two factions of clones and I can't figure out what to name them. I'm very bad at giving names. I mean, I still feel a little embarrassed at the word Death Eater. I don't know how Rowling got away with that. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. If I if I'd made the word Death Eater myself, I would be I would be embarrassed, really. And so when I come up with t titles that may sound uh, that may sound ridiculous, it, it, it gives me pause. So, um, but they're just, in, in case any of you are really good at naming things, I have the oldest clones in the world are split into two factions. One of them is hedonistic and wants to hunt humans in their own little nature reserve, and the others are nihilistic and do not care. Um, they find the nihilists because they believe the uh, hedonists are the ones that, that they're going up against. She got away with things because her audience grew up with her stuff, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she hit the level of sales where editors don't touch your work or you get to full of yourself for editors to touch your work. I'm not, I never know which, which actually happens, but you can tell when an author of a series, not even a series, because it happened with Stephen King's books, you can tell when an author stops being edited because their books just grow and grow and grow. I'm not saying The Stand is not an amazing work, but King can write amazing stuff on the shorter end. And, uh, ever since The Stand, except, I, well, I guess you could do The Green Mile, there were a couple of novellas in there, but he's written a lot of books. But yeah, there have been so many huge, fat books. Is Six Weeks on Audio? Yes, it is. I narrated it. Um, unfortunately, where are you coming from? Because the, uh, world English rights, including UK... New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, those never sold. So, um, and my publisher owns the rights to my recording of the book. So in order to release the, the book elsewhere, I would have to either re-record it or sell the rights and have someone else record it. So, um, if you're in the U.S., yes. And Canada, I think. But not any other English-speaking place, I'm sorry. Um, feeling that this is for a second draft makes me want to look more into this cause. I've got a story that's a hot mess, and I've given up trying to edit it. That is, um, that's a good idea. And if you do it, please let us know how it goes. Because it's, if you look closer in, I mean, you know, you can't read it. I can barely read it. But this is the, the breakdown of Silence of the Lambs. And, you know, seeing that is a really good, um, seeing that, dis that uh, example, sorry, seeing that example is a really good way to um, see if your own book can fit in there. So, uh, yeah, give it a try. I'm eager to hear how it goes. Okay, you are in the U.S. Yes, it is available on audiobook.
the lack of sales of world English rights is a little bit of a bitter point with me. Uh, elsewhere in the world, English speaking, you can buy the ebook. That's all I got for you, unfortunately. Um, complication crisis, um, discover. They're worse than hedonists. Um, partly because I don't want to spoil absolutely everything and partly because I'm not sure what happens. I'm just going to go big battle. Big battle, y'all. Plus death. And then, at the end we go, um, survivors escape via shuttle, to attempt to help Earth. So, Again, I'm still not sure what the difference between the climax and the complicate or the crisis and the complication are. But perhaps if I read the book a little closer, I would get that. Um, there's also something in here that's external charge and internal charge, and I have no idea what that is. So, yeah, I really do think if you've got a book you want to edit, this is a great. Um, detailed tool. It also uses, um, where is it? Right, I had it on the iPad. Um, a spreadsheet kind of way of looking at things to help you break down your scenes and say what happens in the scenes and that helps you see if the, if, see if, see if the scenes are too bloated in one area or too uh, spare in others. And I find that one really useful. Um, also, I discovered that, at least for the Mac, Scrivener has a story grid. Scrivener and story grid can work together with the uh, Excel sheets, the spreadsheets. So if you are a Scrivener Mac user and you want to use the story grid, um, I'll try to find that again in the show, and I'll put it in the show notes. Gotta make a note for myself. So, um, yeah, that's. I'm sorry, Story Grid turned out to be a little too dense for what I needed, and I was unable to get a really clear look of what it is, but. I'm thinking I might revisit it the next time I have to edit something. Um, I outline my whole story scene by scene, now like five chapters into writing it and questioning everything. Yeah, that, that's, that can happen whether you're doing pantsing or uh, outlining. Just at this point, follow the outline. You had an idea of where you wanted to go, so go in that direction and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, well, you'll know one direction not to go. But um, don't question it. Five chapters in, that's a pretty standard place where people go, oh crap, what the hell am I doing? And uh, so just know that you're not feeling anything. It's not you. <laughs> it's not your story. It's what most people do, unfortunately. So uh, that is me with Story Grid. Um, can't decide if it's more of a train wreck than Snowflake Method was. But, um, yeah, is there anything you guys would like me to discuss? I'm going to check and see if I have any feedback emails, just to fill this out. Um, yeah, you guys talk amongst yourselves, I gotta find, there it is. Okay.
Okay, we got a question about um, point of view from Kalinda. I normally write in first person or tight third, but I've been toying around with a new story idea that would need to be written in Omni. Uh, mystery part is part of the plot, so I don't want to give the game away too soon, but Omni is causing its own problems in that I feel like I'm not tight enough on the action. I'm not entirely sure what not tight enough on the action means, but the really neat thing about an omniscient point of view is you can decide what to tell people and what not to tell people. And you, I mean, you can do that in any point of view. Agatha Christie's murder of Roger Ackroyd, the narrator is the murderer. He does not tell you, <laughs> the point in the book where he murders the guy, he does not say that. He says, like, one very obscure thing. But he does not say, and then I murdered him, and then I tried to cover it up. So, omniscient can be the same. You can tell whatever you want in the scene. And you can choose what to hide and what not to hide. Um, whenever I think of omniscient, I think of a specific scene in Good Omens, which was played for laughs, obviously, it being Good Omens, but um, there's a point where the uh, the demon has de delivered the Antichrist to the nunnery and delivered it to a specifically mm, stupid n uh, nun. And the stupid nun thinks that... No, wait, sorry. The stupid nun thinks that the American attaché is giving birth to the Antichrist. I can't even remember. But the point of the thing is, is the, the babies get mixed up. And so it goes into omniscient because it says, here is what the nun says, and here is what she means. And then here is what the other nun says in response, and here is what she means. And it's it's lays out the misunderstanding very clearly, and it's very funny. And I murdered t trying to tell what it was. So, sorry about that. But if you uh, haven't read Good Omens, it's it's worth it. And uh, that scene is, is one of my favorites. It always, always lets me... Uh, Actually, I think the whole book is omniscient. It just goes really omniscient then because it tells you what people are saying and feeling. But I think you can handle the omniscient point of view. Don't don't feel like it's telling you what you have to write. You still get to decide everything to write. Um Sorry. Casey writes, where's the question? Sorry, it's a longer email. Um, I was complaining about um, the classical stereotypes in the 45 master characters being um, a little too heteronormative and not telling us how, you know, a Hades and, a, and an Apollo would have a love story. It only tells us how the Hades and the Aphrodite character would have a love story. Um, uh, Casey suggests that... Why do we assume Persephone was born female? Maybe a new project could be turning those stereotype tropes around and looking at them from new angles. That's true. But the, it still has a binary thing, and um, that that kind of cuts out non-binary folks and where they would fit in a story. So I'd like to see some sort of update to that. Um, and Casey mentions an actual uh, state here. I'm not going to do it, but I'm not going to say it. But the question essentially is how do I find uh, resources or groups that I can investigate for uh, it, workshop gr groups, writing markets, stuff like that. Um, looking to find writing opportunities. 
how can you do that during COVID? Oh boy, um, you're gonna have to find the, um, you're gonna have to find the writing workshops online to start out with. There are several. Um, I usually recommend the same two, and I haven't done any research into others, but uh, where I got started was the Online Writers Workshop, which has a specific focus on science fiction and fantasy. Um, there are, like, nonfiction writing groups that meet. I don't know what they're doing um, when, during COVID. I know somebody who runs one, so I can ask him. Because it's a really good question. We still gotta write stuff and still gotta try to make money. So, um, but for now, you're gonna have to look online. There's, we're gonna be doing um, virtual write-ins during NaNoWriMo here on Twitch and YouTube TV, if this is actually <laughs> successfully streaming, I'm trying to stream there. Um, at the same time. We'll see how that works. But we'll be doing uh, write-ins to, to help people sort of get that feeling of doing write-ins during NaNoWriMo. But yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't know. I, I guess it, it would be the same advice I would tell you as somebody who's like, sometimes people write me from very, very far away and want to know how they can find a writing group, and the answer is the internet. It's, um, that's pretty much it. We've got the internet, which is great. So that's a happy thing. Um, but I will, yeah, throws like a girl, if you don't, uh, hear from me, I want to tell you some more specific, one more specific thing I want to tell you, but it has to do with the ge geographical area, and I, like I said, I didn't want to disclose that, but, um, yeah, so I think that's all of my emails right now. As I mentioned last time, or someone asked me recently if there's a, uh, if I was going to be doing a feedback show anytime soon, and I'm not getting a lot of questions, so I think I might do, um, I think I, sorry, I think I might be doing a, asking you guys for questions, asking Twitter for questions, and then hopefully getting enough to do a full feedback show at one point. Um, Omniscient Point of View is a funny for a biblical type story, yeah. Good Omens is the best title era ever. Yes, it's Good Omens or the nice and accurate prophecy, prophecies of Agnes Nutter, comma, witch. Gotham does free weekly write-ins. That's really cool. Thank you, Todd. Um, I know Cat Rambo is doing something. I don't know if it's free or not, but look up Cat Rambo. She used to be uh, head of the Science Fiction Writers of America, and she's just an all-around amazing person, and I heard she was doing live write-ins that was helping some people, so you can check that out. I mean, I also want to help you out with your I know you want more than just a writing group, you want resources, and that is the harder thing during COVID. Um, but yeah, that's my information there. Does anybody have anything you would like me to touch on? Happy to talk about it. Again, I'm disappointed in StoryGrid. I'm disappointed in myself for not realizing that StoryGrid was not really a good first draft outlining tool, but, you know, instead of being disappointed, I should just say, what I've done is shown, at least myself, <laughs> which outlining tools work for me and which don't. I hope that if any of these sounded good to you and I did not, if Snowflake or StoryGrid sound good to you, I hope I showed you enough to where you feel comfortable moving forward with it. Um, but yeah, I just discovered that, yeah, it's, it's, it's save the cat for me. That's my thing. Um, so if nobody has any further questions, I am Mer Lafferty. This is I Should Be Writing. 
I stream Tuesdays and Thursdays at 12.30 Eastern Time on Twitch and YouTube, I think. Again, I just set that up right before I went live, so we'll see how that turns out. My website is Merverse.com. If you're listening to this later on the podcast and you want to catch a live stream, it's twitch.tv slash mightymer. Pretty much mightymer everywhere else that I have a social media account. I have books. I have Solo, A Star Wars Story, the novelization. I have Six Wakes, which was a multi-award nominated book about clones and death and murder. And, um, yeah, if you want to support the Patreon, you can do patreon.com slash mightymer, or you can uh, become a subscriber on Twitch and get neat little art to throw at people in the chat, like a startled chicken. And, um, yeah, I've got startled chicken, and I've got Krobus from Stardew Stardew Valley peeking out from behind a, uh, Sorry. (laughs) Peeking out from behind a gravestone, so that's fun. Anyway, that I believe is all I gotta say. Thank you all for coming by. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for chatting. Thank you for lurking. If you didn't chat, I appreciate you watching anyway, because I know sometimes people don't want to hang out in the chat, or can't. So, I appreciate everybody who's hanging out. And I will see you um, Thursday. I thought it was Thursday for a moment, but Thursday I should be writing... I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about. If you guys have any questions you want me to address, or if you want me to look at any of the other writing books that we've been talking about for the past two weeks, let me know. Um, Be happy to do so. So that's Thursday, 1230 Eastern Time. And until then, you should be writing.